Uh, okay, good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone. Uh, the fun part is like things start to pop up on the presentation while I'm presenting. Yeah, okay, we are from Life on Log Head and Hockey Abuse Theater, too, is like a research that we have been doing for about 10 years actually. And the first thing that I have to say is, so Martin, there is a so, so few people that I have promised that this year I would send the fauna for them, but unfortunately, actually the 17th was the day that my ticket was booked to US to make the, the, yeah, the research this year. But with this quarantine thing, we postponed everything for next year. And I'm really sorry for everyone, actually, even for my students that they were really looking forward to go. But anyway, this is a research done mainly by two labs here in Brazil, with me and Nirun in FSU. Mm -hmm. Then these four guys here are the main contributor for this, but we do not, uh, we cannot forget like the people that are engaged with the turtle itself. Then let's keep going for Part of it I have been present here already, many of you have seen, like, when we talk about male fauna and turtle, normally most of the people will see at this, when I, I always ask what you see, it's a turtle, it's like everybody actually focus on the cute and nice turtle itself, while we were focused mostly at the turtle shell. And what we were interested in was what is in here. And actually, this is not really representative. This is not a picture that is really representative about what's a turtle. Because a turtle is much nasty than this. When we look at a turtle, that's what we found. Actually, the species that we are talking, they do have much more fauna associated with their shell. Normally, most of the people that were working with us were the people like in Kaja Tatu sample or at least target the turtle while we were target wherever else was on the turtle shell. And saying that, what I mean is normally we target all the fauna that were there, that is like from macro fauna, or even the fauna that were under, like under inside between the scoots. When we amplify all these, what we get was a huge numbers of male fauna taxa. And these huge numbers actually pop up with some kind of community structure that we were wondering few aims. And then we did follow up in four different aims. I'm going to talk about the first one that is, what is the structure, diverse and function of citrate epibionts, male and macrofauna. Yeah, we do give uh, like a questions just to tackle a few people. Have we scratched the surface yet? Or how do this traveling ecosystem, that is one of the nice things that we call them from a few years on board, traveling ecosystem survive and thrive, is because, yeah, are these male fauna communities really? stable functioning and uh, reproductively and we will see later on and what kind of interactions take place between epibionts and the carapace on the carapace uh, at the end Yerun will talk a lot at the the, the last aim and you know, what is what insight can male fauna epibionts give us on loggerhead ecology and vice versa and then that's our last manuscript from last week's then you don't look touch on the male fauna paradox and the use of male fauna in citrate ecology and conservation. Uh, everything started like in 2010 when we started to sample uh, a very short, let's say, part of the, our littoral. That's something about 14 to 20 kilometers beach line uh, here in Brazil, in the state of Pernambuco. Actually, this was a quite nice uh, setup to sample and everything because we could go with like motorized vehicles, like specific motorized vehicle, but yeah, we could go from with motorized vehicle to the beach and we could sample over there. And this ended up 
into the publication that they are with some it's quite old one already i think 13 14 that is a 2014 and this was i think 2018 uh, we have like two publications already proving that there was a high diverse in composition of macro and mayo found on carapace of, uh, of carapace of epibiont ox sea turtle and also we did prove that they are quite dynamic but let's go to the results and then so on and then we will see over there our Hi. second study case hello Hi, nice. Peter, so no. yeah our second study case was in the south of us in the florida uh, peninsula when we went to the gulf of mexico and that was actually an invitation from Yerun. Uh, he knew the previous two works and he was actually asking us if we didn't want to repeat it over there and the thing was the first two manuscripts went out with very few numbers of turtles we have about 13 turtles and number of fauna was really high but we still have we needed a much higher sample size and then you must say like would you try to repeat it over here and we look for this like tiny island in the Gulf of Mexico, just in the map, we, we could barely see it it's, yeah, over here somewhere. And we say like, okay, we can go. But then you don't just mention to us, but ah, this is a protected area. It's a completely different environment than you were sampling. We cannot go with motorized vehicles. All the houses itself that have lights facing to the beach, it had to be life, lights in red. That means turtle safe lights and then so on. And we went there and there was one single problem. Like you cannot drive in the beach. That means you have to walk it. And we're like, ah, let's travel to US, let's walk the beach. When we arrived there, that's what we found. And then it starts to not be fun at all. Let me just clean this here. Uh, yeah. We have to walk about from 12 to 20 kilometers every night. So that means overnight to find turtles and actually improve our sample size. Indeed, we do find a lot, but please yeah, don't really go in a sea and uh, go in the beach and try to find turtle overnight. These are really wild animals and they really try to survive. That's what they really don't like us close to them. And we do need very basic permits to work with them. And that's our permit number. I'm obliged to show all the time my, our permit numbers in US and here in Brazil. Otherwise I could not even be presenting any kind of like presentation. And when I don't show them, many people just complain like, do you have the permit to touch the turtle? Yeah, we do have the permit to touch the turtle. And that was not a really fun moment. We normally need at least two, three people to hold the turtle and make the sampling. The sampling is mainly based on clean the turtle as much as you can. And that means we need to actually hold the turtle and you can see it being done here by Anthony, one of our collaborator. Sorry, uh, there's Sophia also helping me and I am scraping the turtle here. I, I am the only one who have pictures while the turtle is scraped because actually the photographer was in my team but Yerun was doing just the same in another team just like a few meters away in another turtle and we are in this battle against like the turtle sorry for the turtle in, in this time because we really have to hold her here you see that we have to make measurements of the shell itself just to be able to calculate the densities and then so on from the male fauna and yeah, using the putting knife, I am just scraping everything that is in there. Two things that are quite important for people that will probably try to do something like this. It's like there is very, very much uh, fauna close to the soft tissue, and we really need them because they will really, like, say, differentiate the our last density but they are very very soft tissue that we have to be really careful but yeah and here just uh over picture at the end i'm already cleaning the turtle is really calm you can see that the guy is holding the turtle with only one hand 
he's really exhausted now already. Yeah, we cannot stay more than 30 minutes with the turtle. We have a, like a really timing uh, permit. But anyway, let's go for the interesting part, the turtle wash. This is what we find when the turtle finish their nesting. And that is what we have to do with them. We have to really, we, many people joke with us, they say that we are the car watch for turtle or the turtle watches. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we have to take everything that was in the shell, but really everything and place inside vials to study. And many people will probably ask, and I will leave it for the last, uh, the last speakers from your room that you would be able to see that we really add all the sediment together with everything that came into the turtle to the pot. But anyway, we did have a turtle dividing section because it was too much fauna. Our materials and metal, we divided the turtle in three different sections, the anterior part, the middle and the posterior part. In this case, in 2018 was a very poor turtle year, poor amount of nests. Turtle was not very much healthy at that year. We only had 23 turtle. But if you count that every turtle give us three male fauna sample plus three macro fauna sample, we do have a free pool of samples. And the problem is like we have about 30 days to spend in the beach and analyze all the samples before we move back to Brazil. That gives like 15 days of sampling and 15 days to, yeah, wash all the samples, clean everything, put in slides and try to identify as much as we can. And it has been quite surprisingly efficient, but yeah, we do have a quite good and good team. And when I say a good team, because sometimes it, it can be very, very tricky to work with this fauna, because it's not the same fauna as in tissue, intertitial fauna. Okay, everything that we were in the fridge went to the wash and we do the decantation sieving period with two sieves like 500 in the top, 32 in the bottom. And in 2019, we completely changed to, we have less time in 2019, then we, we shift everything that was washed in the lab become washed into a washing station. This is the nicest thing that we built it up. This is a washing station for the field itself. It has some automatic washes in it and everything, but everyone that was, these ones, all of them were walking the beach during the evening. All of them were just like, not during the, during the night, they have four hours of sleep and then wake up and have to wash all the samples. That means while we were after turtle during the night, we were after the samples during the day, and then we could save a lot of time. And that make as much more efficient and we, we were able to do much more uh, turtles in 2019. We had to double the number of turtles. But yeah, uh, what we find, yeah, we find a huge number of everything. Uh, a few things that we are not even, at least male fauna workers are not really used to, like cyprids, bivalves, and then so on. There is a number of crustaceans that are to follow panidas and amphipodes and, and so on. There are funny polychaetas as well and really nice ones that we can also see. Ah yeah, there are some fauna that uh, for the normal like interstitial male fauna would trick us. If I ask you for instance which ones are cypris and which one are ostracodes, I'm not going to take long on this. I'm not going to wait for no one answer because that's a really tricky question. These are all separate okay if you see these like if you see such things like these in a sample many of you probably would say that's our code or also this one that's our code you can even probably some of you would even argue that you can see their uh, appendices and then so on but no this is yeah the lot cypress that is the larvae of a cypress and we need really to be careful why I work with these because they really resemble some of the fauna that we normally see, but we don't see cypris frequently 
on our male fauna sample. There is other guys, fun guys, like this one. Um, I'm also not going to take long, but if I ask someone to identify these, probably they would take some time until they find out what is that. Actually, we took some time until I realized that this is rush, uh, sorry, horseshoe, horseshoe crabs larvae that we find into the shell as well. That was fun because it was not many, but that really gave us some headaches to identify them. But anyway, let's keep moving. Then what we have here in Brazil that actually took our mind to go further was we have consist consistently much more fauna. We have much more fauna, at least the male fauna, in carapace with or associated with macrofauna, while compared with carapace without macrofauna. Then not only male fauna numbers, abundance were different, also the richness decreased drastically. And if we look for the community structure itself, we did have one very nice result was like when we separate like shell with no macrofauna, shell with only two macrofauna specimens, sorry, species uh, or taxa, or shell with three and four taxa, what we saw is was always the fauna get much close related when we have more macrofauna, showing that the macrofauna was playing a structure uh, service for the male fauna over there. And also, if you see the numbers in the top here, they all means the number of nematode species that we found on a single turtle shell. And it was, there was few turtles at this study that the, it, this was like Oxbill sea turtle. Uh, they were much cleaner than the one that Yerun was going to show. And also, numbers of diversity and richness increase with the increase of numbers of macrofauna in the shell. Right, we did compare the number of fauna that we have with all the hard substrate fauna that we knew from male fauna. The largest number we had previously was 56 nematode species from one manuscript in macroalgae. That was from the same area actually. And uh, when we look for the turtle shell, we have over 80 nematode species on the shell, it means that nematode species was much rich than the turtle, uh, sorry, nematode species was much rich on the turtle than in any other substrate. We did run a scene proof and we didn't run many other similarity profiles and we saw that the turtle shell has a unique similarity profile. It didn't share with no other, uh, let's say, community that we had, no community from like macrophytes or other hard substrate was similar to the community that we have in the turtle shell. It means that that was really a unique community. But when we run a a PCO, we could see that it was a very unique community because it was actually in the border of all the hard substrate that we, we, we have found in the literature and all the macrophytes. That means the turtle shell, it's really having found for both habitats. Yeah. Uh, to be able to talk about stability there, we were talking about the trophic groups. Is this fauna with all the trophic groups and all the life stages? What we found was indeed with the increase of macrofauna, also we have an increase of numbers of every single trophic groups. And uh, if you look the darkest, uh, sorry, the darkest, the highest number of macrofauna that is the graphic that we can show here with high numbers of macrofauna we did have all the trophic groups well represented in the turtle shell i'm running to see if i can make it to 15 minutes but i'm seeing that i'm going much further but anyway let me finish this first we also have all the life stages and uh, 
yeah, let me just give you the conclusions. Like we did have, there was facilitation of macrofauna and mayofauna there. That means promotion called macrofauna promote colonization process. We did have a pro reproductive active community. That means, oh my goodness, my pencil just stopped to work right now. Fine. Then that means we have a, like a nice turnover happening in a stable community. And we did find our functional group. That means as well, we have a persistence, persistence and fully functional community. And up to now, well, up to what I am saying to you, we have about 80 generated species, more for species. That was a really the highest that we had found up to, we went to US and then I will give the floor to Yerun because then Yerun can talk about what happens when we went to St. George Island. So St. George Island, great. We're there, it was hard work. Lots of walking, lots of mosquito bites, lots of mosquito spray, very little sleep. It was so much fun. Um, it literally was blood, sweat and tears. <laughs> um, we ended, you know, it's, it's just really hard work to get it all done in, in such a short time. And um, there's a reason why we only do it for two weeks because um, everyone's exhausted after one. Um, we literally do, you lose a few people that just, either get exhausted, uh, we have to, you know, people have, have breaks of uh, one or two days every once in a while. It, it, it is intensive work, but it is, uh, it is worthwhile. So as Giovanni explained, um, perhaps there was one question, uh, perhaps this is not a bad idea to, to explain, is the, um, so how do we carefully sample it? So, you know, when you see a turtle, uh, it depends on what it's doing, whether we can interact with it or not, according to the permit. So you have to wait until they've uh, nested until they lay the eggs and start covering up the nest. We're not allowed to interrupt for obvious reasons with the nesting process. So we have to wait until the loggerhead, the female loggerhead has, has finished nesting. Uh, and then the turtle biologists do their measurements and they tag the flippers and uh, put pit tags in, little chips in the neck um, and do the measurements. And then when, as the turtle is moving towards the sea, there's only one thing on that turtle's mind and it is getting back to the ocean. Um, loggerheads can, get up to, what was it, 250 pounds, uh, it's about 100, 120 kilos or something like that. And they are huge, they can be huge. And it, despite us trying to slow them down, they have, you know, one thing on their mind, and it's literally like these massive bulldozers that are very hard to um, to, to stop to, for us to, to scrape. So as Giovanni said, there are a few people around, you know, to try and slow it down. We cover the eyes to calm them down, although sometimes they might bite you for that. Uh, or tap the shell um, so it moves the other way. That's another trick we can do. But all in all, we're basically most of the time walking on our knees uh, with a putty knife, gloves, and containers to get all the all the stuff off. So once we actually get to the sampling, it is uh, get some of the sand off because when it's digging the nest, a lot of the sand gets onto the shell, um, and then we we select the sections and we we work per section. Uh, so anterior, middle, posterior. And the barnacles are the worst because they sometimes they are encrusted and it's very hard to get off. So we actually use a, a metal putty knives, but they're like flexible metal, you know, like the ones you you paint, uh, you scrape the paint off um, for the, um, uh, in the house. So that, and we use a small hammer and we put it at the base of the barnacle and we knock them off uh, and they, they come off really easily that way. Um, in the past, the turtle people, they've done this survey since 2016. We only came in at 2018 for the epibionts. They, um, they use um, pliers at first, basically pulling off the barnacles, which can sometimes damage the, um, the, the carapace. So we, we were very careful and with the putty knife on the barnacle, they pop off if you give it a little tap with a hammer. And then we carry on with a larger putty knife to scrape the entire region carefully. Because in some, some cases, the loggerheads have these uh, flaky, flaky scoots like uh, an old carapace, I'm assuming. And you, you just have to be careful you know, when you scrape it off. Um, but then we, we finish it all off with, um, uh, you see the sponges in the sieve there. We finish it all off with a, a, a sponge with, um, with fresh water. And we basically sponge it all down, down to get all the organisms that we can't see uh, with our bare eyes, um, as all myofauna people are generally used to. Um, 
Giovanni, shall I admit Maria? Okay. Okay. Um, cool. So these are some of the representatives of the um, uh, organisms we found. The, the top one is an amphipod, um, a, a skeleton shrimp. And uh, funnily enough, we, uh, we find them in, in the myofauna as well as in the macrofauna uh, in huge numbers. I think the total numbers, but I'll come back to your table with the total numbers. But I think over 100,000 of these little critters. And then we find mites. These are just like two pictures, but we find loads of different uh, uh, organisms. All right, and we found loads of nematodes in a total of 111 genera. So automatically, that means at least 111 species that we found. Um, uh, a lot of interesting ones as well. Uh, plenty of uh, uh, trichoma, trionema, desmodorids, spherolimus. So we also get the predators on there uh, and quite a few Rictesia actually. Um, so this is kind of a heat map. <coughs> Um, basically, the darker the color of the cell, the more organisms we found. And uh, contrary to the, the common assumption that nematodes are always dominant, uh, in this case, it was a nopli larvae, mostly ascribed to copepods, um, uh, almost entirely copepods. But um, well, the reason, one of the reasons I'm showing this heat map is also because of the, if you look at the uh, uh, at the bottom, we get some really rare ones as well, and um, the the ones on the on the right hand side, the red triangle uh, inverted triangles, those are the beach samples. So we did take samples from high tide, uh, high beach, middle beach, and low beach near the water line um, to to have an indication of when the turtle is you know uh, swooping up the sand on the shell. We don't want to contaminate our samples, so we we did have to have some control samples to check for. Um, uh, contamination and we can see obviously that the numbers are extremely low uh, compared to what we find uh, on the turtle. So this is the uh, the table with all the numbers. Um, dun -dun -dun -dun. So yeah, lots of organisms uh, basically. Um, and if you look at the right hand side, um, there is the, the total, the, the right hand column, um, those were the total numbers on each of the turtle. Each line is a turtle. You'll see 413 or 415 there. Um, this one we recaptured the day after we sampled it because uh, they come back. You know, some some uh, turtles will either do a false crawl. You know, they come on the beach, decide uh, they've changed their minds. They go back in the water, and then the next day they'll come back up to to actually make the nest. So sometimes you know you, you do encounter the same turtle twice, and we know that because they're tagged, so we can identify their number and we know the turtle. So actually after one day, you can already see that we find over 300 organisms on the, on, on the shell. So there is a uh, very high potential for rapid colonization. Um, and interestingly also, that was the turtle that gave us 146,000 organisms the, the day before. Um, so interesting numbers. I think the average uh, that we found on each turtle was about 30, 33, 34,000 organisms. Um, uh, Martin was asking that the uh, you know whether we did a soft bodied where we find the soft bodied uh, organisms as well. Uh, we do these results are all from death samples, right? So uh, as we discussed in previous sessions, they're not very conducive to um, preserving soft bodied myofauna. Despite that, we did find a large number of turbellarians. Um, um, but I can't see many of the other ones. So we are possibly missing a trick there. Um, I have to say these samples were processed very quickly, i.e., you know, within a matter of a couple of weeks. Um, last year we did it actually this, the same day or the day after when we just drove back and forth between the field lab and the, the lab here um, to get processing and counting straight away. Um, and they are all preserved in death still. Um, so uh, we could come back to that in the discussion, uh, but there are plenty of opportunities for, you know, um, we can't pay to send samples, but if you give us your, you know, your details and you, you'd like to receive these samples, then, you know, we, we can certainly arrange, uh, arrange that. So nematodes, copepods, hydroids, Psychomasticophora, that's the forearm, caprellids, that's the skeleton shrimp, cirripeds, bivalves, turbellarians, amphipods, polychaetes, nopli larvae, huge number of them. Uh, polychaete larvae, ostracods, pycnogonids, 
Actinidia sands, Akari, Insecta Luna. And if I'm not mistaken, we found some tardigrades, but only on the beach. Um, I got, um, I from, I over there, Tassiana, I mute. Okay. I need it. Okay. So when we compare the um, sample abundances, so the big, the big circles are the turtle samples and the beach uh, are the tiny green ones. So the, the abundances are, you know, hugely different. So we're relatively confident that, you know, we did not get significant contamination that would skew our results from the turtle carapaces. And when we look at total myofauna abundance here and total nematode abundance for the three different sections, so anterior, middle and posterior, we see that there's no differences in terms of abundance. But when we look at diversity for the myofauna, you know, higher taxa level, we didn't find any significant differences. But when you look at the nematodes, we really see that the posterior section, uh, you know, that there's a gradient of increased diversity as you go to the back of the turtle. And th there's potentially variable uh, explanations for that. So it turns, this, these turtles, they kind of, um, you know, they're benthic feeders predominantly. So uh, they kind of head down, they, they dig in through the sediment, uh, the kind of like faunal mining almost, they call it. Um, so there's potentially a lot more disturbance at the front end of the turtle. Also, sometimes the, the front flippers, which are the most active ones, they can disturb the anterior middle sections. Uh, an alternative hypothesis is that they, when they float to the surface, is that they, sorry, when they float to the surface, is that they, um, the, the top part could be um, exposed to dehydration. Um, you know, when they're floating on, on, on the surface, that, they, that that's a, a cause for disturbance. Um, so th there's various uh, possible explanations for that. But the posterior section is the most diverse ones, is the most diverse uh, section but for nematodes. But we do have to take into account also the potential effect of macrofauna, as um, Giovanni's explained, the facilitation of the structure provided by macrofauna or larger organisms is something that, um, you know, can, uh, can really affect the abundance and diversity of the myofauna. So a, a quick look at the higher taxa myofauna community structure. You can see that, that you know, at the gradient from anterior to posterior, you, see, you really see an increase of nopli um, uh, towards that. And I guess that's also a little bit skewed by that uh, one turtle that had over 140,000 organisms on it because most of it were no play on the posterior section. But there is some community structure differences between the sections, uh, which is interesting. And again, we want to relate that to the macrofauna to see uh, whether, you know, there's any relationship uh, between those two. Now, when we do an NMDS on, on the, uh, the myoforma taxa, we do see that there are two different groups of turtles based on the epibiont communities. And Again, it's the nopli that, that mainly distinguishes uh, them from others. So th the question is, you know, why are, no, why are nopli, or co mainly copepod larvae, um, distinguishing that group of turtles? Is there, is there a, an environmental reason for that? Uh, are these tur have these turtles in that those two groups been colonized differently? Have they been in different areas where they've been feeding prior to arriving to the nesting site? And that's a question that we don't quite understand yet, but it's something that we hope to explain in the future. Um, and when you just use a bar chart, a relative bar chart of uh, rel you know, relative abundance of the myofauna taxa, and this is each turtle separately, you can, you can really see the, you know, the effect of nopli on the, um, uh, what's it? Mm -hmm. Let me see, yeah, so these here, they're all nopli. They really separated the, uh, these turtles from the rest, which is, which is very interesting. And it could potentially be uh, water column colonization that, you know, the different area that these turtles have been, that would be the most uh, likely explanation, we think. So then into the nematodes, we used various metrics for diversity to compare the sections. And they pretty much all show the same thing, or every metric you use is gonna show that the posterior is more diverse than the middle, and the middle is more diverse than the anterior section. So there's a consistent trend there. Uh, and also an evenness, you know, when you look at N infinity, which is the reciprocal value of um, the abundance of the most dominant taxon. So basically, the higher this number, uh, the more evenly distributed the taxa are. Uh, and again, also in that, it's a more balanced, a more equitable community on the posterior section. Then some K dominance, uh, cumulative dominance curves. And it, it again, it shows the same thing. You, you 
reach the maximum species diversity relatively quickly. Um, and the anterior section, as you go through the, the numbers of uh, uh, species or genera in, the, in our case, uh, and it, again, it shows that the posterior section is more even and more diverse. Uh, dun -dun -dun -dun. Ah, so this is the comparison of the myofauna, the, sorry, the nematode genera uh, over the three different types of sections uh, that we had. And, and again, we see um, that there are significant differences in community structure. Um, we're not entirely sure what that's relate, related to. Again, we have, really have to compare that to the macrofauna, which we're doing at the moment, um, to see whether you know the, the heterogeneity on the, the different sections caused by larger organisms, etc., is really um, you know driving this community structure or the availability of food sources, etc. There's a lot of variables on these little ecosystems that could drive the nematode community structure. Uh, and when we you know look at every turtle separately, we can see how you know oh, sorry we can see how the um, the uh, cluster analysis separates these you know four groups uh, of turtles so and that's the interesting but and that's that's something i want to talk a little bit more about i know we're running a bit late but i guess we do have time um is that when we look at the nematode structure of the epibiome uh, communities and we look at them per turtle so forget about the sections just per turtle we see that there are four different groups of turtles that have that are distinguished by looking at the nematode community structure and that's interesting because you know we want to find out why that is you know why are there four different groups of turtles? So we have a PhD student at the moment, Ian Silva Gorgias, who's working with Mariana Fuentes, who's a, a assistant professor at FSU here, and she's a turtle ecologist. Um, and so we, because we also have the turtle data, you know, we have the turtle measurements, uh, we actually have nesting data. So we have volunteers from the island where we took the samples the next day in the mornings. They go and check all the nests and they protect them uh, to potentially protect them from predators. Uh, and then they monitor it also. So they, uh, you know, when they all hatch, they they have some sort of measure of uh, product production success. You know, uh, how many hatchlings were there? Uh, did they all survive, etc. So uh, we have some sort of measure of uh, reproductive success of the turtle. But we also have stable isotope analysis uh, done on the turtles themselves, and we have genetic data on the turtles themselves. So the next task for the PhD student is to, to see whether the structure that we're seeing in the epibiont communities, whether that's myofauna hyotaxa, nematode genera, or, um, or the macrofauna, is whether we find a similar structure in the, the turtle biology or turtle you know, DNA or isotopes. And that would be fantastic. If our patterns overlap, that would mean that epibiont communities really are kind of like um, a... Um, not a replacement, uh, um, an indicator that the turtles themselves are different also. And that then leads to the question, can we use myofauna or macrofauna for that matter to you know, get to know anything about um, the behavior of turtles? You know, if we, um, if we can, if the patterns are similar, then we could potentially infer um, that these colonization patterns are different. It could be related to the environment, but it could also be related to where they come from. I mean, where have these turtles been foraging? Um, because they do forage in different areas and there's different populations of turtles. So, you know, it's, it's only logic that these turtles are colonized differently if they hang out in different areas. Um, now, in the future, we hope to confirm that with potentially genetic analysis of myofauna from origins and, you know, the, the turtles themselves. Uh, but for now, we have to do with stable isotopes and comparing patterns, stable isotopes of turtles. Um, there's been some barnacle studies that have shown that uh, using some modeling, you can really uh, trace back um, potential areas where turtles, these loggerheads have been in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but it's, it's a vague measure because, you know, the, the resolution of isotope data isn't, isn't that specific that you can pinpoint, you know, it's been at that beach. Uh, several months ago, you, you, you can't quite do that. Uh, but we hope to make some advance in, in that context anyway. So using myofauna potentially as an indicator of um, where loggerheads have been um, and 
that could potentially because satellite tagging loggerheads is expensive and it's very limited in terms of the, the the temporal scale you get it's a tag of six months and you know specifically where one turtle has been um but it doesn't give you kind of like a community or a population view necessarily um and that feeds all into potentially being very useful for turtle ecology and conservation um which i'm guessing is what we're receiving a, a bit of a attention uh, for this study at the moment and then you know when you're playing around the primer there's all these different options and one of the things we wanted to do is to have a look at see you know what the trends are between the different genera of nematodes and you can do this uh, analysis called uh, coherence curves um, and it's basically a cluster analysis but instead of doing it on the samples you can do it on the on the variables so on, in our case on the nematode genera and it it gives you significantly different groups of nematodes in our case, or genera, um, that behave differently according to a gradient or an a priori chosen um, a gradient or, or structure that you choose. So in our case, it was anterior, middle, and posterior. And we see that there are a number of genera that behave differently depending on the section that you look at. I'm not gonna go into detail. Uh, we, we say something about it in the paper, but it's interesting nevertheless, but we haven't gone as far as trying to interpret why, for instance, Chromodorina is very low uh, relatively uh, an anterior section uh, compared to the posterior section, or why it's the other way around, for instance, for Theristus and Cialidae. Potentially we could um, look at, you know, whether it's uh, increased disturbance and see whether some genera are more favorable, you know, whether if you go to the back of, the turtle, whether these genera are more um, um, persisters rather than colonizers, that's something we, you know, we still have to analyze. So I think kind of in summary, um, so loggerheads have greater epibiodiversity than hoax builds. Uh, Giovanni found 80 genera, we find 111 on loggerheads, so 80 versus 111. That's just the nematodes, but we also find higher taxa. The higher taxa level of myofauna diversity is higher. I think we have 20, 20 higher taxa, pretty much the whole range that you can think of on uh, myofauna uh, we can find on the, on the turtles. Um, abundance was much higher, and I think this is potentially also related to the macrofauna abundance. The fact that it creates these little 3D structures and a lot more niches for, for myofauna um, to thrive in. Um, preliminary data also shows that the macrofauna is actually much more abundant on loggerheads, so that kind of makes sense. Um, we've, been, we've proven for hoax spells that macrofauna does indeed facilitate myofauna. Um, we yet have to prove that for loggerheads, but I think that's going to be the case. Uh, we find distinct myofauna and nematode community structure between the different sections. Um, not so in abundance, but community structure and diversity are different depending on the section you look at. Um, we have distinct myofauna communities that show different groups of loggerhead turtles and the same are, is the case for looking at, you know, when we look at nematode genera. And that then feeds into uh, potentially looking at um, the actual turtles themselves and see whether the epibiont communities can tell us anything about the turtles. That's the next step. And of course, one of the things that we, said in the in the paper was that uh, you know this was kind of the back of the envelope calculation is the the myofauna paradox i mean when you look at the recent papers it's not really a paradox anymore we kind of understand that myofauna get all over the place whether it's currents or disturbance or uh, floating or phoresis or you know or zoochory uh, all these mechanisms enable myofauna to disperse passively mostly um so what could potentially be the contribution of sea turtles uh, and any other large, you know, ocean uh, animal for that, for that matter, you know, whether it's whales and we don't really know, you know, uh, some of these uh, ocean uh, migrators, how much myofauna they carry. But if we do the calculation for the, the turtles, the numbers become quite staggering. I mean, if, you know, we find on average over 30,000 per turtle we know that the numbers of turtles are you know hundreds of thousands or millions depending on the species and we also know that those numbers have been decimated in the past century you know if you go way back the number of turtles that's why they're vulnerable most of the species right now um 
are you know the, the numbers must have been enormous if you go back um a century ago and then you you kind of add to that the evolutionary age of turtles which is about 120 million years if i'm not mistaken so we've had on geological time scales we've had massive potentially massive um dispersal uh on on sea turtles basically uh between coastal locations so we argue that there's a significant potential for myofauna exchange just by looking at turtles and you know that could be true for many other animals and of course many other means of dispersal passively whether it's you know floating goose barnacles or um or ice for that matter in the arctic uh, katrine Worse has uh, published a paper it's a year ago two years ago showing that for a particular myofauna size annelid um so uh, there is huge potential um there we think but we don't really know how the colonization process on the back of a turtle happens. You know, how quickly does that happen? Uh, where specifically does that happen? What are the different stages of colonization? And that's a question, some questions that we would really be interested to investigate further. And related to that is what's really cool now is that we have a number of turtles, I think a total of 60 odd from 2018 and 2019 in total um, that are tagged, have been cleaned. So we have a T0 for colonization which means that when they come back to the, to the general area to nest in two to four years, um, and we recognize the tag, then we have two to four years of colonization. And if we investigate the communities then, um, it'd be really interesting to see and compare um, the different colonization patterns, because that could really tell us, uh, I remember the papers that Giovanni published a couple of years back, one of the reviewers was really arguing, well, you don't have a T0. You can't say anything about colonization because you have no idea what happened and over what time scale it happened and over what spatial scale it happened. That's true, but we're hoping to you know, resolve those issues with the, the study that we're doing now and hopefully you know, can carry on in the future. All right, that's it. That's a crawl, that's a, that's a, a log ahead crawl. So that's what the people in the mornings um, try and, and find and then track back to the nest and um, so yeah that's it thank you